My name is Grant Oliphant, and welcome to Stranger Than This. A pro- I'm stranger. <laughs> yeah, well, that too. <laughs> is that the, I was like, is that the title now? Because that's appropriate. <laughs> It's so good. It's a Freudian thing, you know? I would have loved that. (laughs) Oh, it's not. Man. My name is Grant Oliphant, and welcome to Stronger Than This. This is a special podcast series of candid COVID-19 conversations where we're talking with folks who have a broad view of what's happening during this crisis and how our society is responding, not just now, but as we look ahead to the future. For those of you who are looking for our regular We Can Be season, stay tuned for that later this year. We'll be coming back to it as soon as we're able to. The Stronger Than This series is recorded remotely with a quick turnaround time from recording to release and with minimal editing. These episodes give a unique unvarnished opportunity for some deeper insight and more immediate insight into the current crisis. You'll be hearing from those on the front lines of the crisis as they share firsthand experiences, challenges, victories, and what they see for the long road ahead. So we try to understand what's happening through the lens of where we want to go and what we want to have happen in the society that we are already in the process of rebuilding. Our guest today is Leah Lizarondo, founder and CEO of 412 Food Rescue, which melds technology, logistics, and civic engagement to fight hunger and promote sustainability. Since its founding in 2015, 412 Food Rescue has become one of the fastest growing food recovery organizations in the country, diverting over 10 million pounds of perfectly good food from waste to organizations that help those who are food insecure. She earned her master's degree in public policy from Carnegie Mellon University, where she now holds the position of entrepreneur in residence, which I love. It's so fitting. Leah has been honored with a 2020 Global Leadership Award from Vital Voices, an award whose past winners include folks like Hillary Rodham Clinton, Melinda Gates, and Malala Yousafzai. And a 2019 We Empower UN SDG Challenge Award given to five women from around the world who are advancing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Leia and 412 Food Rescue have been featured in media pieces by NPR, Fast Company, Martha Stewart Living, and The Washington Post. She was born in the Philippines and now makes Pittsburgh her home. She's also been a friend and a colleague to the Heinz Endowments for a long time and somebody that we've been working with very closely during the present crisis and an honor to do so. So after all that preamble, Leah, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. You know, there's so much to talk about. I think where I want to begin is just by asking you the question as a human being, how are you doing? How am I doing? I'm generally doing well. And I think a lot of working moms will say that really the hardest part of this is trying to work with a seven-year-old at home. I've heard this from a lot of parents and mostly from moms because that just is how it works, I think. You have been juggling an immense amount of work with parenting at the same time, but you and your family are doing generally well. Yes, luckily we're all healthy. So let's talk a little bit about what 412 Food Rescue is. I just want to say by way of honoring what you're doing that you took an incredible model and made it more incredible by pivoting immediately in the context of what you discerned as changes on the ground. But let's explain what the model is. How does 412 Food Rescue work? So 412 Food Rescue was founded to respond to the fact that pre-COVID and for a long time, for 50 years, the United States has been wasting almost half of its food supply. And this is something I read about in 2012 after reading a National Resources Defense Council report called Wasted. You know, we all know that waste happens. You know, our parents have been telling us, you know, eat all of the food on your plate. There's someone, you know, starving somewhere far. And the reason why food is going to waste most of the time is because it just can't be collected. So when the grocery store has, you know, an overabundance of kale that they have to get rid of today because it's not going to be good two days from now, you can't dispatch a truck for a case of kale. 
But what concerned me, this batch of small vehicle, it's that logistics disconnect that was causing this, this big gap. On the other side, we know that 40 million Americans, again, pre-COVID, are food insecure or $500 away from financial disaster. And a lot of the nonprofits that we talked to said, sure, if you have food, we will definitely have a use for them, even if they weren't traditional food pantries. So there were the grocery stores on one side that really don't like wasting their food, but they had no option. And the nonprofits on this side that really want the food, it's just that there's no transparency transport in between. So that's what we solve. We form one primary function and that's transporting food from one place to the other. And so we crowdsource this transport network. It started with, you know, texting friends, you know, started with the East End Co-op, the Panera here, the Brugger's there. And then soon, you know, grew to thousands and thousands of people through technology, which functions in exactly the same way as any of these commercial driver networks. And you, as a result of that, created a platform that in Pittsburgh rapidly became the largest volunteer-led food delivery network in the country. And now you've seen this platform be licensed out, in effect, to a set of other cities. And this is all pre-COVID. What has been the appeal of this? Why have literally thousands of people signed up to be what you call food rescue heroes? Our lives are so distracted, so segmented. You know, I'm sure like you, you read a lot of articles about the way we work, about how we don't work within stretches of time. We work in short segments of time. And this is how we plan our lives in general. Mm -hmm. So when we volunteer, we can't anymore as much plan, you know, I'm going to do four hours this Saturday. But I know that there's many people who hate seeing food go to waste. And there's many people who want to help. If there's an app that's reminding you every day that look, there's food here right in your neck, you know, five minutes away from you. It'll take you 20 minutes to do this volunteering. And that volunteering work that you do is going to be highly fulfilling because you're not going to deliver it to a warehouse. When you pick up the food from the donor and you fill your car with produce and fruit and guacamole and all of this wonderful things that you yourself actually really want, you say to yourself, it wasn't for me, this would have gone to waste. Right. And then you drive to the nonprofit and they greet you and they're always happy to see you. You're, you're a hero to them. And everything in that experience is something that makes people keep coming back. And they see their impact right away within that 30 minutes that they spent doing this one thing. We live in a society where, first of all, there's an underappreciation for the amount of hunger that there is. We also tend to think as a society that there are mechanisms for taking care of this. So there is a food bank, for example, and we saw during the, the initial days of the pandemic epic record-breaking lines outside of food banks here in Pittsburgh, but also around the country. And that's the mental image that people have of the system that's set up to address food. You've partnered with the food bank, but you're not the food bank. Why is there something else needed? How do you explain to people why this network of connecting small sources of food with nonprofits is an important element in this system. Okay. So this is where I start to nerd out on logistics and distribution. And this is um, the perfect program for that, by the way. So, <laughs> so go for it. You know, the food banking system is 50 years old and it's, you know, an important system, an important network. There's over 200 food banks in the United States and most of them deal with non-perishables. And the reason for that is that, you know, most of these food banks are structured, you know, in a very traditional hub and spoke warehouse model where food needs to stay stable for a while. You know, so nationally, about 15% of what's distributed at food banks is fresh food. Mm -hmm. So there's already w that one gap there. And we know that populations in poverty or at risk are more susceptible to disease. So there's one opportunity there that needs to be targeted. The second is when we talk about hunger, we typically talk about food deserts. So these are areas where, you know, within one mile or in Pittsburgh, because of our terrain, really within half a mile, there's no grocery stores or any source of food. 
So people don't even have any options. And food deserts typically occur in areas of poverty as well. But when we're talking about hunger, there's very little conversations about transportation deserts and mobility. So even though there are many pantries, in our region, I think our food bank serves about 365 food pantries. When you map all of those out and you overlay a transportation layer on top of that, which is what we did, and you look at how many people simply cannot access a food pantry given that fact that there's no high frequency transit in their areas and that 75% of people in poverty do not have access to transit. The easiest examples I get is if you are a senior taking a bus, you simply can't carry a 30 pound senior box from a food pantry or for women with multiple children. You know, if you pick them up from school at three 30, you're not going to take two bus rides to get to a food pantry because you know, one of the, it's just not going to work. I have a car and I can't do that. Right. There's a problem of reach and mobility. So this transportation network that is not run by trucks, but your cars and my car, we can go to more places that trucks can't go. That means we can serve more nonprofits than ever before. We serve over 600 nonprofits. And these are could be small nonprofits like a family support center that, you know, serves eight families or vintage senior center um, right on Highland Avenue where my mother goes. So we can deliver to these nonprofits that serve vulnerable populations without needing trucks. And then the second thing is, you know, if a truck breaks down, all of the scheduled deliveries that day will not get delivered. Grant, if you get called off, you can easily request a sub. And because we have 10,000 people waiting, someone can easily say, oh, Grant's off, I'll take that delivery. And nothing is missed. It's very redundant transportation network. So between the redundancy and the reach, our reliability level is at 99%. We miss only 1% of food rescues available. And commercial delivery services typically perform at 95%. Yeah, well, thank you for nerding out on that because it's actually really helpful and it's interesting. (laughs) But then along comes COVID-19 and the world changes from this already broken system into an even more broken system. What did you see immediately? How did you begin to think, boy, we might have to do things differently because this is different? Our COVID response came in stages. So the first stage, which was, you know, from mid-March to the end of March, we experienced the largest level of donations ever. And unfortunately, primarily because a lot of things closed down. Universities closed down, workplaces closed down. And and when you say donations, you mean food, not money, right? Not money, food surplus, yes. And so we had to manage all of that. At the same time, trying to keep our volunteers safe. The last two weeks of March were the most harrowing weeks we've ever experienced because we wanted to avoid anyone getting sick. But at the same time, there's so much food and so much need emerging. Mm -hmm. And we were able to manage that. We changed our protocols in our app. We have the highest level of safety. Commercial delivery services have been pained for not keeping their drivers safe. We changed our protocols. We changed our protocols in the app. We changed our donor protocols so that we can make sure that all of our volunteers are safe. In March, we experienced the largest surge in volunteer registrations on our app. And the reason for that is we are the only volunteering opportunity that requires no congregation. This is actually an extremely solitary opportunity. You do it alone. You can do it with someone from your household, but it doesn't require you to be in any building. All of our processes are no contact. And then past March, one thing became very, very clear. The most vulnerable really cannot be served by existing traditional networks. They just simply can't go to drive up food distributions. They can't go to grocery stores. They can't go to food pantries. So we really needed to actually become Uber Eats. So we were delivering to nonprofits before, and now we really needed to deliver to homes. And what is amazing about our team and really kudos to the people I work with 
is that they made it happen right away and enabled our technology to be able to enable our drivers to deliver not only to nonprofits, but to homes. And so this system was designed to respond to this crisis. And, you know, we feel extremely fortunate that we are in a position to do this. You did a very interesting thing at one point, and I remember that it was on your birthday that you sort of made this happen, but you did a partnership with Casa San Jose and other community partners where you engaged in a particular hyper version of this. Can you talk a little bit about what happened there? So on one side, for to Food Rescue is about, you know, making sure our food sources are not wasted. But on the other side, we are all about taking this opportunity of food source and making sure we use it to reach people who are not easy to reach. And so when COVID hit and school was called off, the first thing that, you know, came to our minds at 412 Food Rescue is, you know, what about all the children that depend on school food? Pittsburgh Public Schools is 100% free and reduced lunches. So Pittsburgh Public Schools, of course, valiantly, you know, still continue distributing food at the schools, which is, you know, great. However, we do know that kids need school buses to get to school, especially younger kids. They just can't get to school to get the food. And it's been an idea that, you know, I've been wanting to do, which is, okay, if kids can't get to school, but they can get to their school buses and school bus stops every single morning, we know this for a fact, why don't we reverse distribute food? Mm. Until one day, my friend Rosa Maria posted on Facebook, desperately seeking help for this family that she's supporting and saying that, you know, they have to walk a mile, these children, to get food. And that's one lunch. You know, I reached out to her and said, 412 can't do this alone. But if we work together, can we try to do this and pilot this project? We also worked with A plus schools to make it happen. And so we piloted at, you know, six bus stops with the help of one Pittsburgh celebrity who funded and invested in this risky pilot and made it happen. And that was? Michael Keaton. Yes. <laughs> so he was a real superhero um, during that yeah. time. And he couldn't have swooped in at a better right, time. Right, right. You've helped develop a forward-thinking technology. You've It's classic social innovation. You've taken a problem that has existed for a long time. You've combined it with technology and some new thinking and created a different platform and crowdsourced a, a solution. And yet we still have the problem of hunger. I'm curious how you're wrestling with this as you're thinking through, I've got this immediate crisis and I want to connect people with food, but what's on your mind about what we have to do differently when we emerge from this or as we're emerging from this? Because at some fundamental level, we shouldn't have this problem in the first place. That's a really good question. Hunger is a symptom of a larger problem. You know, when we talk about the sustainable development goals, you know, really SDG2 is, you know, zero hunger, but really it's about zero poverty. And that, unfortunately, will take generations to solve. And hopefully one of the things that comes out of this crisis is a big shakeup of how everyone thinks about how we live. But Foreign to Food Rescue was founded as an in-the-meantime solution because we're presented with this undeniable opportunity that there's almost half the food supply that is feeding landfills when we know that there's people that need to be fed. Right. And so it's almost like we're buying time. We're buying time until poverty can be solved. And what I love about this solution is that it requires all of us to do something right now. And it's enabling all of us to do something right now, you know, making us aware of the problem, not as something that is abstract, but if you go to a nonprofit, you go to a shelter, and now if you go to a, someone's house, maybe you live in Shady Side and you've never been to McKeesport, but now you are in McKeesport. And mm. now you see the homes in McKeesport and you might from the window see the, the woman that is extremely grateful for the service that you provided today. And maybe that humanizes the problem for you more than it already has. And that changes mindsets. And for me, I'm hoping in the long game, 
you know, that will solve equality, that will solve how we treat each other, and that will give us all true empathy. Yeah. It's actually such a great observation. I think this is maybe part of the hidden genius of 412 Food Rescue. You're engaging more people in social problem solving, and they have an opportunity to see and experience community in a different way. I hadn't thought about it, but it's exactly right. It may in and of itself be part of the social change tool that we need. We've spent so much time talking about hunger because it is the issue that I think defines the moment related to your work that we find ourselves in. And you've done such an incredible job of pivoting to respond to it. But there's a another longer term aspect of your work that I wouldn't feel complete if I didn't talk about it with you, which is climate change. And right. I'm Share with us why climate change is even on the radar of a 412 food rescue and how it relates to what we're experiencing now. Right, right. Yes. So this report about 40% of food waste going to waste was from the Natural Resources Defense Council. Mm. And the reason for that is that food waste is the single largest component in our landfills. It is one of the leading causes of greenhouse gas emissions. And that's only at the end of its life. When we throw out food, we not only cross greenhouse gas emissions in the end, we waste all of the resources that we use to produce food. And we've seen numbers, you know, to produce, you know, one single hamburger, you need, you know, 300 gallons of water or whatever that is. Yeah. So when, when you mitigate food waste, you mitigate climate change. And one of the things that is difficult about climate change is that it's so hard for people to wrap their heads around. It's an abstract concept. But what we've found is that when people see food in their cars, then they understand that, oh my goodness, all of the things that the farmers work, the water, the land that was used to produce this food would have gone to landfill without me. Project Drawdown, which is one of the leading think tanks on climate change, identifies food waste as the number two intervention that we can do to actually draw right. down and reverse climate change. It, it's such an important connection, I think, because people tend to think of climate change as an abstract concept. And yet, what you're illustrating in real time during an immediate crisis is the way in which we relate to that problem also affects how we relate to hunger and the dynamic of hunger in our own communities. People need to see these challenges as connected because they are. Right. And being able to rescue food and prevent food from going to landfill gives you a sense of being able to do something about it. I think when we think about climate change, a lot of us revert to despair. Because we think it's such a large issue. It's a, you know, whatever I do is a drop in an ocean. Right. But rescuing food, you see quantities and that sense of despair, you know, is it disappears and it gives you even more inspiration for action. It always comes down to what can we do personally in our own lives. And you've created a mechanism by which we can actually all do something. I'm curious, are there lessons in the entrepreneurial focus that you have brought to this work for other nonprofits? I love answering this question too. If there's one thing that I can you know, impart as a, an advice, it's, you know, we've heard of in software development, this agile methodology. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what agile methodology is, is basically an embrace of imperfection. You know, you create a product that is kind of the product that you want, you know, it's called a minimum viable product. And you release with that. You don't wait for things to be perfect. You know, you see how it goes and then you adjust and release again and adjust and release again. The old way of doing software was you design this big software design, it's called waterfall. And then you create the diagrams for it, create the data models and it takes months. And then what's hard about that is that you invest all of this time and then it doesn't work in the end. So with an agile methodology, you can have an objective. For example, the bus stop project, we didn't start and say, you know, we're going to go to the 4,000 bus stops in Pittsburgh. We're going to pick six. We're not going to wait a month. We're going to do it tomorrow. We're going to see what we learn. And then what we learned this week, we're going to change next week. And it gets better and better incrementally. You know, there's no perfect plan. And you accept that imperfection 
even before you start. And it's not failure. It's the way that you learn. I love the whole concept of that agile methodology. And it's it's not typical of, actually, I don't think it's typical of many businesses. So it's just uh, whether they're nonprofit or for-profit. And this this concept of innovating in real time is, I think, scary for a lot of folks. I so admire an organization that can organize itself around the principle of being willing to accept imperfection on the path towards becoming better. It takes a lot of thought and a lot of guts. And a lot of pain. Like I'm smiling I, right now, but you know it wasn't <laughs> that easy. Yeah, that's right. Right, yeah. Well, people can't see the smile on the podcast, so it's good that you said that's it. Right, right. <laughs> yes, you know, all of these things, you know, come with lots of pain. Right. And, you know, people, what people see is, is the 1% that gets out there. Yeah. What do you wish that we would have talked about? Is there anything that we missed that I should have asked you about or that you would like the opportunity to share with people? Pittsburgh has truly a Mr. Rogers mentality. I am not from Pittsburgh. So this is something that I see. And I remember our first proposal to Heinz was we were projecting 400 volunteers. And when we did our first grant report, it was 4,000. And not to discount the other cities that we work with, it's not the same. There takes a lot more work to be able to inspire the same level of action. So when I do license the technology to other cities, it comes with a big caveat that, you know, don't expect this level of growth because Pittsburgh might be unique in some ways that are not the same um, for your city. I'm very grateful. I think, you know, we're, I think, all lucky to be able to work in an environment where there are forward thinking people like you who are willing to change things and, and, and figure out how to apply the best new innovations and thinking and technology to social problems. And that's exciting. I do want to wrap up by noting a, a few things about our conversation. So we've touched on the problem of hunger, which is striking in this country. And if the images that emerged during the course of the COVID-19 crisis don't shock America into thinking differently about poverty and hunger, I don't know what will. But the fact that nearly half of our food, 40% of our food goes to waste, and at the same time that one in eight of us just in a routine day goes hungry and so many more don't know where their next meal is going to come from in the richest country in the history of the planet is is unforgivable. I love the notion of crowdsourcing a solution to the disconnect between the food that exists and the people who need it. I think that's the level of of social innovation that we need if we're going to respond to a crisis like this. I love your idea that part of this work in engaging so many volunteers also builds understanding and comprehension. It builds social connectivity. I have to imagine there will be great follow-on effects from that over the months and years. I love your notion of agile methodology, not just for the nonprofit sector, but for the community in general. I think American communities should embrace this concept that maybe it's okay to keep experimenting, to embrace ambiguity, as you said, and be willing to fail and to suffer some pain along the way in the name of getting it right so that we do things in a better way. And I also finally appreciate your invocation of Mr. Rogers, who famously said, look for the helpers. What you've done actually is create a platform that allows for thousands of people. And now by licensing it to other cities, tens of thousands of people across the United States and North America to be helpers in a way that will address the short-term crisis of hunger in their communities right now, the longer-term crisis of hunger and food waste, and the very long-term crisis of climate change. Leah, thank you again so much for the work you're doing and for taking time out from it to be with us and for navigating all of the intricacies of doing this from home, because that's part of the adventure in the world that we're dealing with now. Thanks for making it better. Yeah. And anytime you need to nerd out on something, I'm always up for that. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Terrific. Thank you. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much. 